to Consider the Sources, Covering America with Quilts. I'm Linda Rendolfe. We are live from the Benjamin Powell House to talk about the quilt collection at Colonial Williamsburg. We'll get to your questions very soon, so please post them in the comments. Before we do that, let's meet our guest, Kim Ivey, the Senior Curator of Textiles. Kim, please tell us a little bit about your responsibilities. Oh, I'd love to, Linda. I actually have the great privilege of working with about 6,000 textiles. We collect here at Colonial Williamsburg not only quilts, but woven coverlets, silks, brocades, and damask, as well as schoolgirl needlework. And we use these collections to help tell stories of the past. I write um, catalog information on the pieces. I help collect the pieces. And of course, we do exhibitions. Wonderful. And Kim, what defines a quilt? Well, that's a really good question. Um, quilts come in a variety of sizes, shapes, materials, and techniques. Um, but typically, a quilt consists of three layers, sort of like a sandwich. You usually have a top decorative layer, and then you have that middle filling, which is a batting, and then you have the back layer, the backing. Mm -hmm. Um, those layers are held together with decorative stitches usually and often using a running stitch. Now sometimes those layers are held together with little ribbons or little tufts of thread and we usually call that type of quilt a comforter. And I guess I should point out that these are very different from woven coverlets where all the color and the pattern is created on the loom. Well, we have a lot to talk about, uh, but right now, let's go to an introduction on what a quilt is. Let's take a moment to learn more about the quilts and the collection here at Colonial Williamsburg. Hello, I'm Kim Ivey. We are in textile storage, where our quilts and textiles are stored when they are not on display in our art museums. We do have about 7,000 textiles in our collection here at Colonial Williamsburg. And that collection includes not only quilts, but woven coverlets, costumes, needlework, and just a wide variety of objects. The quilt collection numbers about 350 pieces. They span over 400 years, and they were made as far away as India, France, Great Britain, and even the Polynesian Islands and Hawaii. Our collection of American quilts is especially noteworthy for its designs, patterns, and techniques. The tray we have open right now is showcasing a collection of applique quilts made in America in the mid-19th century. One of the strengths of the American collection of quilts is its diversity. We have quilts made by Anglo-Americans, Pennsylvania Germans, African Americans, Mennonite, Amish, and they all speak to the multicultural nature of American society. The quilt that we are now looking at is a great example of diversity. It was made by Arlanzio Petway in the G's Bend area of Alabama. This is an African-American community that is known for its quilting. Quilts produced there are often very dynamic. They're bold in color. This quilt made by Arlanzio takes a traditional pattern called Coat of Many Colors, and she really does make it her own. One of the fun things about the quilt are the many different textiles that Alonzia chose to use. My favorite is the Coca-Cola print that we see here with the slogan, It's the Real Thing. The Amish and Mennonite women came into quilting relatively late in the late 19th century. Their quilts are typified by bold, saturated colors, wide borders, and often the decoration is very subtle. And we see the decoration in this quilt in the quilting pattern itself, which consists of wonderful little plumes and small little hearts and just a lovely floral medallion and some zigzags. Our quilt collection also represents a wide range of ages. For example, this little doll's quilt was made by Hattie Morey, and she tells us right on it that she was five years and eight months. Now, I suspect that her mother helped her in the quilting. On the other end of the spectrum, we have a group of three quilts. They were all made by Jemima Parmalee Prentice. She quilted well into her 90s. 
Some of the finest album quilts were created in Baltimore in the neighboring counties in the mid-19th century. These quilts are characterized by beautifully worked floral motifs, reefs, birds, and some of the quilts actually do include architectural structures. The quilt on the far side features just some beautiful motifs and also is embellished with embroidery. Please note, however, that these fabrics were all purchased just for the making of a very fabulous quilt. In contrast, we have a category of textiles that we refer to lovingly as make-do. I'm standing beside one of our make-do quilts. The textiles in it began life has blue resist bed curtains. A very frugal quilt maker took the bits and pieces of the bed curtains and um, cut them out and constructed a wonderful quilt. The quilt maker used her blocks of blue resist curtains alternating with white cotton blocks to create the block quilt design. We collect quilts here at Colonia Williamsburg to help us make connections to the past. I'm standing next to a quilt that has a remarkable story to tell of Williamsburg life. The quilt was made by Mary Gold. She was the second wife of James Gold. James had had four children with his first wife, and he and Mary had 11 more, two of whom were twins. That Mary found the time to make such a beautiful quilt is actually remarkable. Mary used expensive English block printed textiles as well as Indian chintzes, but she made the most out of her textiles by cutting little bits and pieces out. Here we see blocks of expensive textile next to plain cottons that she has then decorated with decorative quilting stitches. In the center, Mary embroidered a beautiful cornucopia in blue silk embroidery threads, and she's filled it with beautiful flowers. The Family Bible is located in the John D. Rockefeller Jr. Library, and in it there is a small obituary which reads, Mary was a fond wife and a good mother. Kim, in the video we just saw, you were wearing gloves. Can you explain why that is necessary? Certainly. Well, of course, it was not a formal occasion. I'm wearing gloves to protect the quilts from any soiling or oil that might have been on my hands. Uh, of course, our quilts are kept in a state-of-the-art state room where we control temperature, humidity, um, light levels, and of course, dust levels. Well, even with that state-of-the-art technology, I imagine there are still some challenges to preserving some quilts which can be, actually be a little fragile, correct? That's absolutely true, Linda. Um, Quilts are textiles, and textiles are susceptible to fading from sunlight or just light. They are susceptible to insect damage. Um, if you fold a quilt and leave it folded, a crease will um, occur. And so as you might have noticed in the video we just saw, our, whenever we do fold a quilt, we pad out the folds with acid-free tissue paper. But yes, certainly textiles and quilts do take a lot of maintenance. Very good. Well, Kim is ready to answer your questions, so please post them in the comments. The Art of Museums of Colonial Williamsburg showcased the Foundation's vast folk art and decorative arts collections, as well as archeological and architectural material culture, all integral to understanding the studies of history. Um, Kim, can you tell us a little bit about the Art of the Quilter exhibition now on display? Oh, I'd love to. Well, the exhibition features 12 quilts, and I have to say that we are literally covering America with these quilts. The quilts represent a wide variety of techniques, including applique, pieced, whole cloth, um, and they are just beautiful. Um, but also they reflect the multicultural nature of American society. We have quilts made by Mennonite quilt makers, Amish, Anglo-American, African-American. That's a lot of different types of quilts that you've got. Yeah, it, we're very fortunate. Excellent. Well, Kim, uh, now let's continue with our viewer questions. Um, one of our viewer wants to know, why does Colonial Williamsburg collect quilts? That's a great question. You know, we began collecting quilts as early as 1930, and these quilts were needed um, to furnish the restored and reconstructed homes in our restored um, town. 
um, the earliest, or actually the first quilt that was collected at the Abbey Aldrich Rockefeller Folk Art Center was in 1972. And since then, our collection has grown. We have about 350 quilts now. And as I said earlier, they do represent a wide variety of techniques, skill levels, materials, and a wide variety of, um, of different cultures. Kim, did it take a little bit longer for quilts to be accepted as an art form? I would say yes. I think because quilts are the work of women and women's work has taken longer to be recognized as decorative art or fine art. Um, an exhibition in 1971 at the Whitney Museum of Art, of American Art, showcased quilts, and I think that was a real turning point. When people saw an Amish quilt compared to modern art, they realized that yes, these quilts aren't only a family keepsake or something to keep you warm, but they are actually works of art. Wonderful. All right, uh, one of our viewers wants to know, what is your favorite quilt in the collection? Oh, my favorite quilt in the collection. Well, my favorite quilt was made by Jemima Parmalee Prentice, and actually it's a group of three quilts that she made. Um, she created quilts throughout her entire life, um, well into her 90s, and we actually have a small scrap of paper where she recorded her quilts, over, and over 80 quilts or 90, and she writes that she made one quilt for the poor widow's wife with a babe, and she made quilts for her family, her friends, for the needy, and in later life she was making quilts for sale and the money was being used to fund Sunday schools on the west frontier of New York State. Wow. Well, um, a viewer named Elaine noted that you mentioned that chintz and silk threads were being used. Is that an indicator that the quilt may have come from a wealthy family? Um, possibly, yes. And I, she might have been referring to the quilt by Mary Galt. Yes, and it did use expensive chintz fabrics and silk embroidery threads, both of which would have been purchased locally, probably at the Williamsburg um, Milliners. And she was very frugal, though, in how she was using those fabrics. So it's clear that she had just enough money to to purchase these fabrics, or perhaps she was actually reaching back into her scrap bag, um, scrap, scrap bag for these um, fragments to use in her quilt. What is the range of different types of cloth that you've seen in quilts? Everything. <laughs> we have quilts made from wool, quilts from linen, quilts from cotton, quilts made from mixtures, and then of course um, quilts out of silk, like Jemima Parmalee Prentice's quilts are all made from silk. Our um, younger quilts, those made in the 20th century, are actually using polyester and synthetic fibers. Right. Um, another viewer would like to know, what's the oldest quilt in the collection? Mm. We have several quilts, actually a group of quilts that were made um, between about 1680 and about 1720. These are English quilts. They were made by professional embroiderers working in England. All right, um, our next question is, how are the quilts in the collection acquired? Oh, well, obviously we would love to have them all as gifts, uh, but we do also receive gifts, uh, I mean quilts as bequests, and we do actually actively purchase quilts um, we have dealers and vendors who know what we're looking for and they keep an eye out for us. We have quilts that are offered to us by family members who are downsizing and realize that there's no one left to take care of their beloved treasure. Is it more challenging to find quilts now than it was, say, perhaps 20, 50 years ago? Good question, and you might think that would be the case, Linda, but actually, because Colonial Williamsburg is so active in putting our quilts out there to the public, we showcase our quilts in wonderful exhibitions. We publish them. They are on emuseum.history.org. And that, um, that brings the quilts to the public eye. And because of that, we have people that are often contacting us, asking us um, um, if we would like to be a permanent home for their quilt. 
Outstanding. Well, Beth uh, says, you are such a marvelous storyteller. So what <laughs> is your favorite quilt story? Oh, gosh. Okay, my favorite quilt story is probably also our most unusual quilt. And as you probably all know, most of our quilts were created by women. There are a few quilts in our collection that were created by men. They were usually professional male embroiderers working in England, um, like those early um, quilts I mentioned. But we do have one quilt, uh, a beautiful hexacomb, or, or actually I should say hexagon quilt, or what some people might call grandmother's flower garden quilt pattern. Mm. And it has a little label on it, and it says that it was created by Louis Philippi in, in Philadelphia in 1863 with his four sisters. And then it goes on to say, and this was the reason for him running away and joining the Union Army at the age of 14. Now, we actually know that he survived his quilt making ordeal, and he did survive the Union Army. Um, and we know that because we have a picture of him in later life. Well, that's a good example of how quilts not only tell family stories, but the stories of the United States. That's true. And you know, some of these quilts can be history lessons. Um, take, for example, our Baltimore album quilts. These beautiful quilts created in the mid-19th century from Baltimore and the neighboring areas. Um, many of them actually are like a history lesson. Um, they feature prominent architectural structures that were important to the quilt maker. Um, one of our quilts has the Battle Monument, which of course was um, commemorating the War of 1812, when Baltimore was besieged by both land and sea by the British. And of course, we all know that was also when our national anthem was penned. Well, that's well before the age of photography. So these quilts are really helping to preserve some of the culture of America and our history. Absolutely. All right. Well, how do you decide what quilts will be on display in an exhibition? It's hard. That's, it's really hard to decide which ones get to go out on show because we do have such a fabulous collection. We, of course, look at the theme. What is the theme for, for our exhibition? We're looking at the condition of the quilt. We're looking at whether it has gone out on exhibition before or never been shown. Um, we want it to be um, enticing to the vis visitor and to uh, maybe perhaps um, make you think about a certain topic or a certain idea. And so there's lots of different factors that go into why we choose the quilts we choose. Excellent. Another question from our viewer is, what's the earliest or how long ago were quilts first made? Oh, love that question. I think some of us would be surprised to know that quilt making has, taken, has been taking place for over 5,000 5, years. Um, the first quilted fabrics were actually used somewhat like protective armor to protect your body um, in war. Okay. Um, Royan wants to know, do you use or reproduce quilts for display on the bids in the historic area? Oh, yes, we do. Um, and that's actually a great segue to what we're going to be looking at soon, right? Um, we have um, a wonderful group of volunteer quilters, which we all will be meeting very soon here. And they um, quilt, they come um, once a week to quilt on reproduction quilts. Uh, the, the program is supported by two wonderful donors, James Boswell and Chris Karachi, who we um, send a big thank you out to. They help support the program by providing the funds to buy the materials for our quilt makers. Beautiful. Um, another viewer question is, what is the youngest quilt in the collection? or the earliest? Well, actually the youngest probably is what you're, you're thinking of. So um, we have quilts that date right up to about 1980. I, I should say though that Colonial Williamsburg does not collect fiber art or, um, or that type of quilt, but we do have quilts up to about 17, um, excuse me, 1980. Um, and keep in mind that the Amish came into quilt rather late in um, the quilt making tradition. So some of their quilts date to 1930, 1940. And then um, many of our African American quilts were made in the 1970s and 1980s. All right. Uh, Susie um, is commenting that 
uh, since we were talking about scraps, she would like to know if someone would buy scraps from the milliner. You know, that's a really good question that I've never, ever thought about. And perhaps we need to go to our millinery shop and ask that question. Um, we know that women kept bags of scraps and they would pull from them. But we also know that many quilts in the 18th and early 19th centuries were made from brand new fabrics. Excellent. Um, Elaine would like to know, do you have quilts that showcase the Underground Railroad? We do not. Um, we do have a number of quilts made by African Americans, um, but we do not have any quilts that we know were used in the Underground Railroad. And that is a big topic that I'm not even sure we have time to fully discuss today. Yeah, well that's a, certainly a big part of American history, but the individual stories are seen to what are more common, correct? With our quilts, correct. yes. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, thank you for those questions. Let's take a moment to learn more about how the quilt collection is used to cover the beds in Colonial Williamsburg bedchambers. Remember, please continue to post your questions in the comments. Some of the quilts in our collection are used as prototypes for the reproductions that we make for our historic town. I'm standing in front of a tray of what we call whole cloth quilts. Now they're called whole cloth because they're actually made of a large seam piece of the same fabric. They're a hard wool that will take a shine when put under heat and pressure. The quilts themselves get their design and their beauty from the quilting stitches and the design can somewhat be hard to see, but thanks to a special program, we're able to bring these quilts to life. The quilt designs have been drawn by Linda Bumgarden, the former curator of textiles. Typically, these whole cloth quilts date to the 18th and early 19th century, so they're very appropriate for use out in our town. I'd like now to introduce my colleague and friend, Francis Burroughs. Hey, Francis, how are you? Yeah. Frances is our textile furnishing specialist, and she and her very special team of quilt volunteers take these drawings and use the drawings to create the reproductions that we have out in the historic town. So this is the workroom where we take the hand-drawn designs of 18th century quilts, and we make them into quilts that can go into the historic area. A group of highly skilled and trained volunteers has been hand quilting for the historic area. We currently have one in the Wythe House, we have one at the Everard, we have another one at the Palace, and we are now making another one for Weatherburn's Tavern. The process is, after getting that small scale image of the design of the quilt, the small image then is blown up on a very large printer paper that our design studio does here at Colonial Williamsburg for me. Then I place this very large piece of paper down on a light table with fabric on top of it. I trace the design. We sandwich it between a fill layer, a batting layers, and we do a little test to make sure it looks good. And then we put it on the quilting frame. And this is where my volunteers come in handy. So very handy. They all uh, come and teach me how that works. About a year from now, with them working four hours each once a week, we'll have a complete quilt to put into Mr. Page's bedroom at the Weatherburn's Tavern. This lovely whole cloth quilt with um, worsted fabric is our latest project in Frances's workshop. And Frances and her team of quilters are going to be showing you the process of making these reproduction quilts. Well, I think it's an honor to volunteer here. I've always loved Colonial Williamsburg, was here mm -hmm. as a kid. It's just a thrill and it's I've learned so much from Kim and Frances and the, just mm -hmm. seeing the collections. Yes. Exactly. Um, it's just awe-inspiring. I just attended the um, Hampton quilt show and the quilts that I saw were all machine quilted on the new long arm quilting machines that yeah. are very popular. They do beautiful work. Definitely. But hand quilting, I think unfortunately it is becoming yes. sort of a lost art. 
I started in upstate New York. I was teaching deaf kids at the time. And I walked into a shop and thought, oh, I'd like to make something like my grandmother did. So I didn't do a small project. I started right out with a queen size quilt, <laughs> all hand applique. But I could take it to class, I could take it wherever I wanted, and I could work on it. After that, I basically taught myself because we moved to California. I hadn't finished the quilt and didn't know how to. So somebody I met showed me how to put on a binding. And we put it in the Ventura County Fair, and I took first place. <gasps> oh, wow. Know that. For myself, I like mm -hmm. having quilts to decorate with and quilts for my dad's. But I quilt for family and friends. My two sons, they have, they have a couple quilts. My grandson has a couple quilts. Made him a Christmas one this past year. Then baby quilts, someone's always having a baby, so mm -hmm. that's always nice. Well, I pretty much quilt for the family. I would never take commissions I've been asked to, no. No. but I don't like people telling me what to quilt. And if you pay for it, you have a right to say what you want. But if you give it as a gift, they have to take what you give them. <laughs> Exactly. It's easier to not take a commission. I think it's a gift of love. That's mm -hmm. why I do it. I couldn't sell them. It's part of my, my life. I mean, the hours you spend at this mm -hmm. frame quilting, you just, it's too special. Mm -hmm. exactly. So when you give it to somebody, it's a gift of love. Mm -hmm. I volunteered for Colonial Williamsburg for other projects and ended up being asked to work here as a quilter. And to me, it's my contribution to keeping the history of quilting, keeping the history of this country going. I love quilting here at Colonial Williamsburg because I feel it's an honor. I also feel that I'm part of that because we compare our quilting to what they have done. Mm -hmm. uh, we see their work and we're able to copy it and I'm like, wow, mm -hmm. it's such such an exciting thing to feel that you're part of this and that mm -hmm. your work is going to be up there for people to see for generations. Exactly. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Well, that was an amazing look into what it takes to create reproduction quilts. And Kim, we have more viewer questions for you. Um, uh, one question is, are there any other reproduction quilts in the historic area? Well, there are actually, Linda. We have quilts on the second floor of Thomas Everard House, and we also have quilts at the George Wythe House. And are those, how did you acquire those? Those were all reproduction quilts made by our quilt volunteers, and once again with funds provided by James Boswell and Chris Karachi. All right. Well, um, are, how long does it take to hand quilt a, in one of these reproductions? It has taken our modern day um, quilt volunteers over 700 hours to hand quilt just one quilt. And that's not including the time it takes to put the quilt layers together. All right. Um, Michelle would like to know how common were quilts in everyday life in the late 1700s? Were they mostly done by wealthier women who could afford the fabrics? Or was it more common to make do with whatever materials were at hand? Well, that's a really good question. Um, quilts that we, the, the quilts that we typically see in the 18th century are what we call whole cloth quilts, like the one that's being reproduced um, for the Weatherburns Tavern. These quilts were, um, could be purchased as well as made in the home, and they really were the product of, um, of a wealthier lifestyle. All right. Julie would like to know, on a similar note, were quilts mostly utilitarian? or were some made for display as decoration in a house? That's another good question, and kind of both, obviously. Quilts are warm, so you would make them for warmth. In the 18th century, they were made for warmth on your bed, but keep in mind that a bed in the 18th century could be a very elaborate um, combination of textiles and wood. And in fact, I've often um, heard a bed of the 18th century referred to as a horizontal throne. If it had hanging bed curtains and then a beautiful quilt on it, it really was making a social statement. So utilitarian, but also reflecting the status of that homeowner. Those beautiful Baltimore album quilts that we looked at earlier, they were clearly made for show and often has gifts and for presentation. But yet, on the other hand, we do know of quilters making quilts to simply keep warm. 
And we have a whole collection of quilts from one Alabama quilter that were made to keep not only warm on the bed, but they were hung in her house, which was drafty, to help keep the, the rooms warm. Well, that was very interesting. Um, Lori would like to know, what year was the Mary Galt quilt made? And you might want to address who Mary Galt was. Oh, okay, right. Um, Mary Galt was the second wife of James Galt, who was um, keeper of the um, magazine and public hospital here. He, um, she created the quilt, oh, around 1790, and it actually is the um, earliest Virginia quilt in our collection. Very good. Um, how long does it take to hand quilt one of these typical quilts that you see? in the collection? Well, I'm um, not really sure how long it took those in the period, but as we just discussed, it would, we know that our modern day quilters, are, it's taking about oh, seven, eight hundred hours to, um, to quilt. All right. Um, well, uh, one of our viewers would like to know, where can they get their quilt conserved? Oh, good question. Um, of course, here at Colonial Williamsburg, we're very fortunate to have a textile conservation lab where Gretchen Guidas, our conservator of textiles, and our assistant conservator of textiles, Jackie Peterson Grace, work on our quilts. But um, for those of you who aren't as fortunate as we are, I would su suggest you go to the, um, what is it, the um, Institute of American Conservation. And I think if I didn't say that quite right, you're going to see a link to that or um, some information on that come up on your screen. Well, thank you, Kim. Another viewer would like to know, how did a person in the 18th century learn to quilt? Quilting is a tradition that appears to have been handed down from mother to daughter, from female family member to female family member. Um, though in one instance, we do know of a quilt um, that was made by a young girl um, named Sarah Cobb of Kentucky, and she learned to quilt working with her enslaved servant, Rachel. Um, a very bittersweet story. It was, sounds like it. Um, Isabella would like to know, if you were to make your favorite quilt, what would it be? <laughs> That's simple or easy for me to answer. It, all the pieces are actually sitting in a paper bag in my closet right now. And it would be one of those very modern t-shirt quilts featuring my son's t-shirts throughout the years. Oh, that's nice. Um, well, another one of our viewers would like to know how to become a volunteer for Colonial Williamsburg. Well, you simply contact Colonial Williamsburg and then ask for our volunteer department and our volunteer staff, our, our staff there can help connect you to the right um, department and that can use your um, skills to the best. Our next question is from Susie and she wants to know whether volunteers have similar stitches per inch like the stitches used to keep symmetry or does symmetry not matter? Well, what I can tell you is that our quilters are extremely talented and skilled, and they do strive for consistency in their stitches, and they typically are on a same level so that we're not going to be seeing too much of a difference between one quilter and the other. Our very finest quilts of the 18th century um, are quilted in about 10 to 11 stitches per inch, and that's the surface count. So that's a lot of stitches per inch, and our modern day quilt volunteers are striving for that, though I don't think they qu quite get to 10. All right, another question is, what future exhibitions should we be looking for? Well, this summer we will rotate our 12 quilts that are currently on exhibition. We will rotate them out and bring in 12 new ones. And that type of rotation will continue for several years. So every year you'll see a new group of quilts go in. And I'd also like to put in a plug for an exhibition that will open in November. It's entitled Stitched in Time. It will be featured in our Alamo Textile Gallery, and it will showcase our schoolgirl needlework. All right. Um, well, we're almost out of time, so let's see if we can get uh, one last viewer question in. And that is, what kind of satisfaction do you personally get 
from the quilt, working with the quilt collection. I am, and I'm going to try not to get teary-eyed here, but I am so honored to be able to bring these quilts to the public and to bring the stories of these quilt makers to the public. Um, we can learn so much from our quilts and our quilt makers. Um, studying a quilt is taking a highway back to the past um, to learn about what was important then, whether it's fashion or um, politics of the time. Um, and I, I actually, Linda, if it's okay with you, I'd like to close with a little quote. Um, it's from an African-American quilter. Her name is Mincy Lee Petway of Alabama. Uh, and she was a quilter in the 20th century. And she said that most people make quilts for warmth and to use on your bed. But quilts are much more. Quilts represent safekeeping. They represent beauty and they represent family history. And what do we do here at Williamsburg, Colonial Williamsburg? We do history, we do quilts. Yeah, absolutely, well Kim, thank you. You've shown us that quilting is much more than an art form, it's intimate stories and the story of America as well. So thank you for that. Well, you're welcome. Well, Colonial Williamsburg Quilt Collection is safeguarded in storage, yet it is still visible in so many ways. Museum exhibitions, a virtual tour, the online database eMuseum, and social media, as well as this live stream. Thank you again, Kim, and your colleagues and volunteers in museums, preservation, and historic resources for sharing your enthusiasm about this important work. Video of this program will be available for viewing at colonialwilliamsburg.org, our Facebook page, and our YouTube channel. Colonial Williamsburg does rely on the generosity of guests and donors like you. This project was funded in part by a generous grant from the National Endowment for the Humanities. We hope you'll join us on Friday, April 22nd for the Architectural Collections live stream. And I hope you'll join us to learn about the collection and conservation of structures and fragments from our history built environment. The live stream precedes the April 30th opening of the exhibition, Restoring Williamsburg, in the James Bowswell and Chris Karachi Gallery at the Art Museums of Colonial Williamsburg. And remember, when you're considering history, always consider the sources. <laughs>